Hello all, welcome back. Hi, my floating media controls here. Um, this is the third lecture. Hopefully it will be shorter than the previous two. And to this this section will focus on uh, plant reproduction and um, at least in angiosperms with a focus on the uh, anatomy and morphology of fruits and flowers. So as a reminder, if uh, you uh, didn't quite make the slog through the first uh, video, uh, plants can reproduce in multiple ways. One, one method is uh, vegetative reproduction or asexual reproduction. And this is where there is some um, uh, new physiological individual. So for example, um, uh, plants that have rhizomes or stolons, of which are above ground or below ground horizontal stems, will send out the horizontal stems horizontally and then a, a new vertical stem can emerge. Over time, the stems can be naturally severed or as gardeners or horticulturalists, you can intentionally sever those and suddenly you have then two separate physiologically distinct individuals, but they are genetically identical. Uh, then sexual reproduction, uh, just like with all other organisms, is uh, it has evolved because it, it enables uh, offspring of uh, parents to be genetically distinct or different at least uh, from their parents. The idea being that um, the more offspring you have, the more diverse they are, the more potentially uh, more potential that population has of adapting to differing and changing environmental conditions. So many plants can do both of these, but um, the focus today will be on sexual reproduction. Just as a reminder from the first lecture as well, is to make sure you're uh, clear about the distinction between how different plants disperse their gametes versus how they're dispersing their offspring. Plants can't get up and walk around, so they have to disperse their genes in the environment in other ways. And they can do that by moving around their gametes, that is their sperm cells, or moving around their offspring. So in the case of ferns and mosses, Recall that they have uh, swimming sperm that need a thin film of water for them to swim in in order to uh, search and find the archegonia inside the uh, gametophyte of, of, of another moss or fern. So they have swimming sperm. And then uh, after sperm fertilized egg, a sporophyte grows out of the gametophyte and eventually the sporophyte will release spores, which are offspring, baby plants. And spores are different than seeds in that spores are single-celled, much smaller than uh, seeds, and uh, they have to germinate very quickly after being dispersed. So you have to uh, produce much, much more in order to, uh, to increase the probability that a few of them will survive. Now with the gymnosperms, which we uh, is, is the overarching term for things like conifers and cycads and ginkgo, but also the nitales, so Wil Wilwichia, um, uh, Needham, uh, Fedra, etc. All of these um, uh, groups of plants disperse their gametes as pollen, and pollen are not sperm, they are tiny male plants that contain sperm. So uh, most commonly, in, in these groups, the pollen is dispersed uh, through wind. So uh, they'll produce a large mass of uh, pollen that can uh, move in air currents. And those pollen grains uh, will then eventually land on a receptive uh, female strobilis or a cone. And then the pollen germinates, finds the egg inside the cone, fertilizes it, and a new seed grows um, at the base, in the case of, like, say, uh, conifers, conifers specifically, at the base of a cone scale. And uh, that turns into a, as I said, grows into a seed, and a seed is much, much larger than a uh, spore, many, many cells. It has an embryonic plant, so a baby plant already inside it, along with some nutritive tissue and, um, to a lesser extent, the flowering plants, but a protective outer covering. And then in the angiosperms, which will be the focus uh, of today's talk, they um, evolved initially to have their pollen dispersed by animals. 
So it can be larger, clumpier pollen um, that can that uh, can attach to animals, and then animals as animals move around to find a reward, which could be eating some of the pollen or even uh, or or, uh, or nectar. Um, those pollen grains uh, detach and then grow on certain parts of the flower, and then fertilize the egg inside the flower. But there are certainly plenty of other mechanisms that flowering plants have to disperse pollen from, uh, many of them have uh, windborne pollen. So think of the grasses, think, think of uh, many uh, trees like oaks and uh, uh, birches, for example. Um, so they don't have as showy flowers because they're not relying on an animal to disperse that pollen. Um, other pollen could even float on water um, and others other pollen can be um, uh, dispersed from the parent plant through through automatic uh, through mechanical means. And then uh, after the pollen germinates, the sperm in the pollen fertilize the egg, the flower develops into fruit. And uh, fruits are more or less unique to the flowering plants as well. They're derived from ovarian tissue by definition. There are some gymnosperms, as I mentioned, like the like needum that have a fleshy outer coating of their seed, but it's not derived from an ovary. So it's not technically a fruit, but uh, the fruits themselves also evolve in different ways to be dispersed by other means from animals um, to floating on water to uh, floating in the wind. And it's these, and it's this, um, uh, this, this structure, the flower, um, and the ways that it's evolved to um, take advantage of, um, or rather, using animals to help with their gene dispersal, that um, has played a, a, a the central role in their evolution. So, uh, as a reminder, angiosperms themselves um, have been around. A while, not as long as many other plants, but longer than many people assume. Um, they really diversified in the late, um, in the late uh, mid to late Cretaceous and early Miocene. But there is a Paleocene rather. Um, but uh, there are certainly fossil ancestors of angiosperms dating back to about 130 million years ago, which is more in the late Jurassic, if I recall correctly. So there's there's also evidence of of um, really early forms of uh, flowers and as as you'll learn the plant parts later um, you can go back and look at the slide but some of these uh, uh, kind of crude um, analogs to some of the flower parts are present in these in these in these fossils so you have kind of loose bundles of structures that release pollen loose structures uh, loose aggregate of structures that contain um, ovules. And uh, those eventually got selected for um, by um, um, by uh, attracting animals through their form and providing rewards like nectar and, and additional pollen. So uh, from this evolutionary arms race that occurred, um, uh, kind of in a positive feedback loop to to evolve different flower forms. Um, the result is a really rapid radiation of species in a relatively short time, in a matter of um, you know less than a hundred million years. A short in geological sense, I guess. And uh, to this day, now I mean, uh, and so to, to the present period, ninety percent of all species of plants on Earth are a flowering plant of one form or another. This does not mean total biomass, as, as I mentioned before. Um, there are many, many, say, pine trees and other conifers in the circumboreal forests that make up a lot of plant biomass too. Uh, but in terms of number of species, angiosperms are um, by far the dominant group today. Oh, yeah. So um, to emphasize that again, one factor in, in why they evolved, why they were so successful was uh, how they co-evolved with insects to attract, uh, attracted by, by those rewards. And then um, the success of, of, say, the fruit, which would encourage animal dispersal by, um, in, in some cases anyway, with, with fleshy fruits, animals eating the delicious outer layer and then defecating the hard protected seed. And the result of that evolutionary pressure was the huge array 
of form as we now see in modern angiosperm flowers. And uh, there tends to be a loose correlation between uh, the for form of the flower and the type of pollinator it attracts. And that correlation is called a pollination syndrome. Uh, and I will provide a paper um, that will add to the Master Naturalist website that you can read about a um, annual review of pollination uh, syndromes if you want. But the, the, the key today, though, is to uh, start to become familiar with uh, the structures of a flower because these are the most complex parts of an angiosperm. And complexity um, means that uh, if there are uh, similar structures among taxa, uh, it would imply, uh, or maybe the default assumption is that um, that they uh, are related to each other. That's not always the case, but um, that is where a lot of this comes from. Uh, uh, so anyway, the, the, this is a, a crude outline of, uh, you can tell I reused a slide, sorry, uh, my slide. Uh, this is a crude outline of a, of a, a simple, complete flower. And flowers are fundamentally uh, described um, in uh, subunits called whorls, W-H-O-R-L-S. And a complete flower, that, um, that is a flower that has all, um, all of its parts, is said to have all four of its whorls. So there are four sets of organs that go from the outside to the inside that we call a whorl. So we'll go through uh, each of these whorls, their names, uh, some of which you'll never have to see again in your life, but just know they have names. Uh, and others uh, will be important to be familiar with if you're using um, a systematic approach to um, plant identification. And because um, these these terms will come up in these uh, dichotomous keys. So the uh, outermost whorl uh, is collectively called the calyx. So I have the, the group name in uh, brackets here. And then the individual subunits are not in brackets. So the, the, the outermost world is called the calyx, and it's made up of multiple sepals. And if you imagine a um, platonic flower, a, um, a, uh, where when before the bud opens, before the flower opens, you see the leafy structures on the outside of the bud. And when the flower opens, those leafy, typically leafy structures tend to be at the bottom of the flower. Though so that is the calyx, that is uh, composed of individual sepals. And nominally, in many cases, the calyx is meant to protect the developing flower. Um, so it doesn't need itself to always be showy. Often it's not very showy, and in some species it is very showy, depending on different selective pressures. But but generally, the, the calyx is the outermost whorl and um, is meant to protect the developing flower. The next whorl in is collectively called the Corolla, which in addition to being the best Toyota, is the name for the uh, collection of petals. So all the petals make up the Corolla, just like all the sepals make up the calyx. And in most cases, the uh, Corolla is the showy part of the flower. It is what is evolved to attract uh, pollinators if it is animal pollinated. So it can be in different shapes and colors that may be of uh, particular interest to different types of pollinators. Uh, now, the uh, these two components, the calyx and the corolla combined, are not directly involved in the sexy bits. So uh, we call that collectively the perianth. Peri is outer and anth is short for flower. So the perianth consists of the calyx and corolla, uh, which in turn consist of sepals and petals. Uh, the next two worlds are what are involved in directly in reproduction in, in, in the sexy stuff. So the uh, the next world in is collectively called the Andresium. Uh, and this is one of the words you'll never have to hear again in your life, but there is an equivalent word like there is for coral and calyx. And andro means male. Um, Esium comes from the Greek word oikos for house. So it's the same root word for ecology. So house of man, if you will. But the individual units, you'll you'll need to know the term stamen. That's the male reproductive structure. 
And the stamen, in turn, consists of two external parts. The anther, which is the part of the flower that produces pollen, and the filament, which is what attaches the anther to the rest of the flower. Uh, so the anther and filament make up the stamen, and the stamens collectively are called the andresium, and the function of the stamens are to produce and release pollen. The final whorl in is collectively called the gynesium, so house of woman is the, that the collective term, but it is made up of pistils, um, sometimes uh, listed as carpels. There is a distinction in that term. Um, we won't get into that here, but but uh, fundamentally, you can think of the, the, the unit of the gynesium as pistils. So pistils are the female part of the flower, and ultimately, they're what contain the eggs. But there's lots of layers before you get to the eggs. So the ex externally, the pistil consists of three parts. There's the stigma, which is where pollen attaches if by a pollinator or by wind, and sticks. There's the style, which is like a tube. And it's through this tube that the pollen grain will germinate and grow through until it reaches the third external component of the pistil called the ovary. The ovary looks a little swollen at the base, so that's why it's distinctive. And the ovary is what contains structures called ovules. And within the ovules are uh, contained uh, um, uh, eggs. So when a pollen grain lands, it, for, it germinates on the stigma, grows through the style into the ovary, finds an ovule, gets to the ovule, and then the pollen tube deposits two sperm cells, which we'll see in the next slide. Uh, so when pollen lands on a flower, it's called pollination. When the sperm cells from the pollen are delivered to the egg, that's called fertilization, just like with animals. Uh, other structures to be aware of, or other terms to be aware of, is that there may be nectaries somewhere on the flower. They can be at the base of petals or the base of stamens. They can be on ovaries. They can be outside the flowers, as we'll see later. Uh, but nectaries are just uh, glands that produce nectar, so sh uh, sugary water. Um, sugars they make in photosynthesis and willfully give up to attract pollinators. All of these parts, the uh, calyx, corolla, stamens, pistils, are attached at a single point called the receptacle. So the receptacle is where all the flower parts are attached, and then that transitions into a structure called the pedicel. Recall in our discussion on vegetative anatomy, the leaf blade is attached to the rest of the stem by a short stem-like structure called the petiole. And uh, this is the equivalent in a flower, the pedicel. And then some flowers have a single leaf at the base of the pedicel. And if that's present or absent or the size of it, the shape is called, uh, it, it's called the bract. And I, I should say, the leaf at the base of the flower is called a bract, and its presence or absence or its its form and shape and even color can sometimes be an, in a, an important tool in identification. So look for bracts um, if, you, if you see them. Um, and critical to understanding how this applies to identification is that all of these flower parts, among species, among families, among orders, um, uh, can vary in their number and, and in their fusion. So there can be, uh, you know, one one species might have uh, five sepals, 10 petals, 10 stamens, and uh, five pistils. Or it could have one pistil, four stamens, four petals, four sepals. And then in other cases, they can be fused in different ways, which we'll look at later. So sometimes uh, during the developmental process, um, the cells of these separate organs fuse. And so it can look like a stamen is growing out of a petal, or it can look like all the petals are fused into a tube, et cetera. And I should say not only can floor parts vary in their number of fusion, but their shape and form and height, relative position, uh, color, uh, relative size to each, of the, um, each other, all of those can vary uh, tremendously. Here's just another diagram uh, from another book I have um, to that helps. Um, but the same idea, we got the calyx, corolla, andresium, gynesium, consisting of sepals, petals, anthers, and pistils. 
Um, and, uh, oh yeah, I wanna add here, um, if in our Master Gardener classes, we tend to do a dissection of uh, Asiatic lilies, really big flowers, you can see all the parts. But in the case of lilies, uh, the petals and sepals look very similar. Uh, there's still a set of uh, sepals on the outside uh, that that are external or in a concentric ring out uh, beyond the petals, but they look very similar. So when petals and sepals look similar, there's another term called a they're called tepals, uh, which is hilarious to me. But uh, so tepals are uh, uh, just when it's hard to distinguish more morphologically between petals and sepals if you come across that. So here is a depiction of what can of what happens during pollination and fertilization. So by whatever means, whatever pollination uh, mechanism that species uses, let's say it's an animal here. So the animal comes along, is looking for nectar and has uh, pollen on its body from an encounter with a similar flower in, a, in the same species and say that that pollen grain gets knocked off and it, it attaches to the stigma. Often the stigma releases this uh, uh, kind of sticky liquid that encourages pollen to stick to it, for example. And uh, then if it is the correct species, because uh, some plants have the ability to recognize if they have their own pollen or not. Um, and um, if, if, that's, if the pollen is compatible, the pollen grain will germinate and uh, grow a tube. Uh, and that tube will grow from the stigma through the through the style into the swollen ovary. It will find an ovule, and then once it gets to the ovule, it will release um, the nuclei of two sperm. Here's a here's a germinating sperm. I'm sorry, a pollen grain, and here's the tube, and there are the um, uh, sperm cells going down the tube. This is growing on like an auger or something. Anyway, there's uh, one of the sperm cells will fertilize the egg, and then another sperm cell or really nucleus will fertilize two other nuclei, um, and then uh, one of those develops into the embryonic plants, and the other develops into another type of tissue called the endosperm, and the endosperm is just stored energy for the embryo and for the uh, seedling as it, as it germinates uh, before it starts to be fully photosynthetic. Okay, does that make sense? Sit with that for a second. Uh, I'm happy to answer questions on this um, uh, on the 20th, on Saturday the 20th. But this is a, a, a very uh, uh, elementary uh, review of, of how how this works in plants. Hopefully that was enlightening. Okay, now, uh, not, all, not all flowers though have all of these parts uh, and not all of them have, um, uh, the same reproductive parts. There can be variation among species and and, and other taxa. So um, when uh, when a flower uh, has both uh, a single flower has both stamens and pistils, it's said to be a perfect flower. So bisexual flowers are perfect. If you remember, bisexual is perfect, then that is up to you. But um, uh, bisexual flowers have both stamens and pistils. So what we learned as the standard flower, default flower would be a bisexual flower. However, um, there are unisexual flowers. So there can be flowers on some species that just have stamens and others that just have pistils. So in that sense, the flowers are um, unisexed. If they just have stamens or they're or also called male flowers, they're said to be staminate. And if they just have pistils or their female flowers are said to be pistillate. So a commonly known example is uh, in cucurbits. So this is from squash or zucchini. And uh, they have separate male and female flowers. And it's only the female flowers that will produce um, a cucumber or a squash or a watermelon or a pumpkin. Uh, because where are the ovaries? Um, the ovaries are on the pistillate flowers or the female flowers and it's the ovaries that develop into the fruit. Um, so uh, here is two other native species that uh, are bisexual. Just um, I can just give you a tour here. 
This is uh, Sanguinaria uh, canadensis. You can't see the sepals, but it does have them. Um, this is in the poppy family, I believe. And uh, there, there are you can see um, what roughly, uh, yeah, what's ten to twelve petals. There are many, many stamens at the center. You can you can see a pistil. This is of hib um, hibiscus uh, coccineus, uh, one of my favorites, um, scarred rose mallow. And you can see, see the sepals in the background, five large petals. And then uh, at the center, you have both uh, male and female parts. So in this case, though, it's fun because the stamens are wrapped around the style. And then above that is a five lobe stigma for this long style and pistol. Um, so and to, to make sure that's clear, a flower is perfect if it is uh, bisexual, so it has both stamens and pistils, and it is complete if it has all of the other parts as well. So in this case, this is a, um, a close-up image of the flower of a uh, grass. So it is said to be perfect, but incomplete. So it has it's perfect because it has uh, stamens and pistils and grasses they're called lodicules because why not um, but it doesn't have petals and uh, sepals so it's incomplete it has other structures um, that are complex in grass morphology that I'll spare you from uh, but because it lacks petals and stamens in the strict sense it's said to be uh, incomplete but still perfect and again this hibiscus here that is both perfect and complete. Uh, and because it's complete, it is by definition perfect because to be complete, you have to have uh, sepals, petals, stamens, and pistils. But it can get more complex. So in addition to having uh, separate male and female uh, flowers on the same plant, you can also have separate male and female individuals in some species. So whenever uh, on a single individual plant, you have male and female flowers that are not part of the same flower, on but they're on different parts of the plant, that plant is said to be monoecious. Uh, so this again comes from the same root word as house. So mono means one. So under one house, you have both male and female flowers. So under one individual plant, uh, male and female flowers um, that are separate, but still on that plant, uh, the plant is said to be monoecious. If, however, uh, individual plants only produce male and female flowers, they're said to be dioecious, uh, like many uh, animals are. Uh, not all, that's complicated. But um, uh, so things like hollies or uh, wax myrtle, for example, uh, have separate male and female individuals. So that individual plant will only ever produce Staminate flowers, another individual plant is sex and only ever produce pistillate flowers. Notice here um, that the, there is a difference in how the flowers look too, um, as we would expect. You can see prominent stamens, but no pistil in the middle. There's nothing there in the center. And then if you look at the uh, pistillate flower, you have a much larger structure in the center, and that is the uh, stigma style and ovary, the pistil. What's fun though is that uh, on at least American holly, I assume others, there are what are called staminodes, which are sterile stamens. Uh, so um, here you can see how the, the, the anther, what would be the anther in the staminode is completely clear and empty because it doesn't have any pollen in it, so it's sterile. And and the, the reason to have separation in the pistillate and the pistils and the stamens, either on the same plant or on different plants, is to discourage self-pollination. The whole point of sex is to have more diverse offspring or have a diverse set of offspring, not just clones of yourself. So it can be advantageous to, um, in this case, physically separate male and female flowers in the same plant to discourage uh, the rate of self-pollination. As I mentioned, some plants have other mechanisms to overcome this too. Sometimes they can recognize their own pollen, even to an individual level. And in that case, they'll abort it. And of course, uh, typically, uh, you know, pollen from another species is not going to germinate or not successfully fertilize uh, the egg of, of another species. So that's not happening. 
Uh, so great there, there can be that there. That's why this that's advantageous, and that's why this has evolved uh, to um, just encourage um, more outbreeding, essentially. Now, uh, this monisi diisi dichotomy is not really a dichotomy. There can be lots of variation between. So there can be um, some uh, plants that have that have individuals that are mostly male flowers with a few female flowers or vice versa. Um, sometimes they can be unisex, can be dioecious and monoecious uh, uh, in some species. Um, so um, that can happen. Uh, it is biology, there's lots of gray zones. But but generally we, we classify them if they are, if they do have unisexual flowers as either monoecious or dioecious. Another thing to look at is the uh, symmetry of a flower. And uh, Typically, they can be classified into two groups. Uh, either they are radially symmetrical or bilaterally symmetrical. In a radially symmetrical flower or radially symmetrical anything, there are multiple planes about which the organ is symmetrical. So if you draw an imaginary line down the center here, it would be with the flower would look the same on both sides of that line. Likewise, if you draw a line in this direction, the, the flower would look the same on both sides of that line. Or you can draw it in this direction, and the, and the flower would look the same on both sides of the line. So that's a radially symmetrical flower. This is um, evening primrose here. Uh, contrast that to uh, bilaterally symmetrical flowers. And in bilaterally symmetrical flowers, the flowers are uh, like our bodies in that there's only one plane, there's only one way that you can draw a line. And on either side of that line, it will look identical. So in our case, that's right down the center of our body, more or less on both sides of the, our nose, our body looks the same. Although we do have our better sides, don't we? Um, and then, but same thing with this, with the flowers. So in this uh, lobelia, lobelia here, um, draw a line here, and that's the only way um, you'll see symmetry. If you draw a line here or here or here, it will look different. Similarly with this snapdragon. Uh, there's only one direction about which it's uh, symmetrical. Then uh, uh, you can also distinguish flowers based on um, how much different parts are fused. Um, an easy example, we'll look at some others in a moment, but an easy example is to see if the petals are fused to each other or not. So if you can distinguish uh, separate individual petals, it's said that the uh, perianth is said to be free or the flower is said to be um, apopetalous. So there's no fusion among flowers. And this buttercup here, um, you can individually attach, detach each petal. Whereas uh, in this uh, penstemon here, toad flax, um, uh, they have um, a, uh, all the petals are fused into a tube. So you could not uh, uh, detach individual petals. So they're fused at the base into a tube, and then um, they do form separate lobes at the tip. And that may suggest that sometime in its evolutionary history, um, these would have been separate petals, but um, no longer. So instead it's one just fused tube of petal tissue. And that has a lot of advantages for attracting certain kinds of pollinators, like especially bees. If um, you, you construct a structure for them to land in and search for uh, nectar, you can confine them to a specific space, which can force pollen on them. Um, and so that increases pollination efficiency in, in this case. And also, as you might imagine, bees like lots of directions and instructions. So they have like little landing strip signs like land here. Uh, effectively. Uh, so anyway, whenever the petals are uh, fused together, they're called fused, and, the, and then a uh, corolla or a, a flower can also said to be sympetalous when this is the case. And there's other terms you don't need to know, but just be aware of that uh, different combinations of fusion of different parts. So say some flowers might have separate sepals and separate petals, so they're both apocephalous and apopetalous. In other cases, you can have a fused corolla into a tube. Um, so it's sympetalous, but the sepals are still separate. Or vice versa, you can have a fused corolla and separate petals. Or you can have a fused calyx and a fused corolla at the same time. So it's both syn, uh, syncephalous and sympetalous. 
And whenever you have fusion of the same flower structure, so say petals fuse to each other or stamens fuse to each other or uh, pistils fuse to each other or, or sepals fuse to each other, uh, that fusion of like parts is called conation. Uh, so in this, the case of this morning glory here, the petals are conate, that is they are fused to each other. And in this case, they're fused together in a particular fashion called um, 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 a, a infundibular corolla, which is to say sort of a, um, like a, 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 uh, a funnel form shape. In other cases, like with this astragalus, um, you can have other variations within that. Or um, so this is a, a species in. Um, hmm, sorry, I forgot what family. If this is a astragalus, that should be a uh, legume. Um, anyway, the uh, uh, in, there can be uh, fusion of stamens, and in this case, there's a a particular uh, Lee, uh, cool, a variation on this called diadelphus stamens, in which you have uh, nine fused stamens and then one that just wants to be different and it's not fused to the rest. So that's kind of neat. So nine to one, uh, uh, but that can happen. So that's called diadelphus. It happens enough that it has its own name. So it, it is, it is a common, it can be a occurrence in some taxa. And then in other cases, like I mentioned with hibiscus, the most brilliant of uh, forms is the filaments of the anthers are fused and then they're in turn wrapped around the style. So next time you look at a hibiscus, you'll see that all the stamens are, are up and down um, or at least near the tip of the uh, style of the pistol. So when all of the all of these stamens are fused to each other, it's said to be um, a monodelphus. And then if there is fusion of different uh, flower parts, it's described as adnation. So like in this um, uh, campsis here, uh, which is a trumpet creeper on the left and on the left and right, uh, uh, the stamens are fused at the base with uh, the petals. And when that happens, there's another term called, um, it's said to be epipetalus. Um, so here's a, a, a graphical depiction of that, where the, the bottom portion of the filament is inserted or fused to the petal. So uh, conation is fusion of similar parts, So you, uh, and then adnation is fusion of unlike parts. So you might see this in keys as um, uh, petals conate, uh, they might phrase it that way, or stamens adnate to petals, or... Um, uh, stamens adnate to pistols, for example. And there's other uh, kind of broad terms for the shape of flowers, especially when their petals are fused, to be aware of. So uh, when there's a fused corolla and it has um, uh, what appear to be two lips or multiple lips, like a mouth at the tip, it's said to be bilabiate. So many uh, plants in the uh, the mint family, like this one here, have what are called bilabiate corollas or bilabiate perians. I mentioned uh, that morning glories uh, have infundibular flowers, also called funnel form flowers. So not only are they fused, but then towards the tip, they start to flare out. And there's a particular um, like folding pattern of the petals that occurs often with uh, funnel form flowers. And you can see it a little bit more in this shape, but but the um, it's kind of brilliant how um, the uh, individual the tips of the petals will fold un under each each other, and so they'll kind of untwist and open. Um, so that's particular anyway. But uh, that that's um, uh, what all all uh, flowers in this family do, the convolvulaceae. Another term that you may come across is a campanulate flower, and this comes from the Latin word for uh, a bell shaped, so uh, from bell, so it's a bell shaped flower. So it's it's fused, but it's kind of squat, and then it starts to flare outward at the tip. And then uh, another one is uh, Ursula. It starts to widen 
and then it starts to narrow and then flares out slightly at the tip. Um, and this is a very common or uh, uh, among plants in the uh, heath family, especially in the genus uh, uh, Vaccinium, which is the blueberry genus. So blueberries will have classic uracilate or urn-shaped flowers. Another term that you may come across is cruciate. So that means cross-shaped. Uh, and it's the Brassicaceae, uh, meaning the, the mustard family, the cruciferae is the other name for it. Um, and that name applies it, but they tend to have uh, almost always these cruciate flowers. So there'll be uh, four, four petals. And in the case of uh, Brassicaceae, the petal is like is folded halfway up. So it goes up and then over. Um, but because there's four, they're, cur they're occurring in pairs across from each other, so it forms that cross shape that's distinctive of that family. And then uh, uh, salviform flowers are sort of like um, in infundibular, perhaps, but what happens with salviform flowers is that there's a narrow tube, and then at the very tip, the petals will flare out at almost exactly 90 degrees. So rather than this gradual tapering opening, it's more abrupt. So tube and then petal at 90 degrees. And that's uh, really seen well in uh, the in phloxus, for example. And then finally, uh, another term that may, you may come across is uh, palopinaceous flowers. So butterfly-like is, is, would be the, the Latin translation. And this is the flower form of many species in the legume family, like peas or like baptisia. And these flowers um, have um, uh, fused petals, um, but they have different shapes and are bilaterally symmetrical. So in a palopinaceous flower, you'll have one set of petals that's, that's fused together called the banner, which is here. And then you'll have two uh, flowers that are not fused, but they're overlapping each other to form a keel like a boat. So those are said to be the keel petals. And then there's two additional petals on the side, which you can sort of see in the uh, Baptisia here, um, called the wing petals. So banner, wings, and keel. Another variation in flowers is the position of the ovary relative to the rest of the flower parts. So the, the kind of original uh, flower configuration as it evolved is the, and the most common is the superior ovary. So in addition to thinking highly of itself, it, it, the superior ovary um, is attached above the rest of the parts of the flower. So if you think of, uh, remember that flower, if you think of flower parts going from the outside to the inside, sepals, corolla, stamens, pistil, in the case of superior ovaries, the main body of the ovary, the swollen, the swollen portion, is distinctively above all the other parts of the flower. Uh, and this is in a St. John's ward here. So you can very clearly see it's probably got four to five uh, sepals and one, two, three, four petals, many stamens, a single ovary with a with multiple um individual styles and stigmas. So in this case, the um, stigmas and styles are not fused, but the ovaries are into a single compound ovary. So that, but, but still, this is a very, a, a really nice example of a superior ovary. An inferior ovary is where the flower parts are attached above the ovary. I'm sorry, an inferior ovary is where the flower parts are attached above the ovary. So in many cases, it almost looks like the ovary has been pushed down below the flower into the pedicel. And classically, think of uh, plants in the cucurbit family have inferior ovaries. So if you look at a, say, cucumber or squash, um, you may see the stigma and style will be evident inside the petals and the stamens. Uh, but the, the bulk of the uh, structure, the ovary itself, is embedded beneath these parts. And this provides an additional layer of protection um, for the developing ovary, so that whenever there, are, there is pollination action ha happening, the uh, pollinators don't accidentally damage the goods, is kind of the idea and, and the selective advantage in theory. So this is more common, this is less common. The presence of an inferior ovary can help you narrow down 
options, certainly. Uh, you may also come across a, another type of structure called a hypanthium. And uh, this is where um, there, the, all the parts except the pistils are fused together in a cup of tissue. So a hypanthium is, is kind of also called a floral cup. And this is classically the case in, common in, uh, in, in many rose family species. This is an example of, uh, from peach. So if you do a cross section of the flower, you can see the stamens and the uh, petals and the sepals are all fused together at the base. And then that continues around to form this cone or, or cup-like structure that in this case surrounds the outside of the separate ovary. So the ovary in this case is still superior, even though it appears that the petal stamens and sepals are above the ovary, but because the ultimate tissue that they're attached to is technically below the ovary. And this is still considered a superior ovary. And there's other variations within that. Um, so you can look at this on your own, but this just shows the different kinds of uh, um, ovary positions with and without hypanthia. And there are specialized terms for each of these relative positions. So again, ovary can be inferior or superior, and it can have or have not a hypanthium. If it's superior, clearly the ovary is above the flower parts. In a, in a case of a superior ovary with a hypanthium or a floral cup, those parts are fused together in a cup and the cup itself is attached below the ovary. And contrast that to a inferior ovary uh, without a floral cup, which the, the ovary is below the other three flower parts. Uh, or if it does have a hypanthium, it's extra special in that the, the, it, it mounts the uh, other parts especially high. They, they form into a cup, and then uh, the ovary is still beneath the base of this floral cup. And because it's biology, there can still be cray zones, like half inferior. It's only a little bit insecure, the half inferior ovary, you know. And... Um, there's a lot here that we could talk about, but but essentially I'll keep it as simple as I can. Um, the like ancestor to flowering plants is thought to have ovules on kind of leaf tissue. And so the ovary has evolved from a leaf type tissue that kind of folded on itself. And um, uh, because of that, the most primitive ovaries will have their ovules, which contain eggs, on one side of the inside of the ovary. And we'll look more at, at this um, in two slides. But um, there, um, it, it's this position of the ovules within the ovary that can give a clue as to if in evolutionary uh, and developmental history, if the, what appears to be a multiple, uh, sorry, what appears to be a single pistol can actually be derived from multiple pistols that have fused. Uh, so in the in if it's in some plants, the, um, you'll have multiple pistils, and those pistils can look completely separate. In other cases, they the pistils can be fused to varying degrees, and the uh, where that fusion occurs, and the resulting um, configuration of the ovules inside the ovary can give some clue to what the original. Uh, 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 original um, uh, number of carpels was. So not not to be, you know, don't don't worry about this too much, but just be aware that um, pistols can do weird things. Um, and and, and uh, um, that looks can be deceiving sometimes. So sometimes you have to do a dissection of these parts to um, understand um, more about their structure. Uh, and uh, just to give you a, a, a some real life examples of how this can vary, here is uh, the flower structure of Magnolia grandiflora, so our common southern magnolia, and uh, it is in a as you remember from the if you uh, were able to make it through the first lecture, uh, it's part of a group a basal group of angiosperms, so a relatively primi primitive group 
of angiosperms and in, in the uh, basal angiosperms, uh, the more primitive configuration or like the, the um, is uh, you have many copies of each of the flower parts and each of those flower parts tend to almost appear to be gradually graduating into from one one type of part to another. So here there are um, many, um, at least initially separate and multiple pistils styles and stigmas. Um, it's only once they produce the fruit that the ovaries fuse together. Um, and um, uh, in, in the case of a magnolia, this is this is what the fruit of magnolia are. It's a it's a um, aggregate fruit, which means the fruit itself is derived from separate ovaries on a single flower, kind of like you would see in, say, blackberries. Uh, but here, the fruit tissue is hard, and then the individual fruit or ovaries open up and they release this seed that has an extra layer of fleshy tissue around it that dispersers are attracted to. Um, then in other cases, just to show you, again, some diversity, this is um, from Malpighia, which is a, a tropical uh, species. But in this case, there are uh, this single ovary with three different styles and three different stigmas. Here's what it looks like when you take off all the petals. So if you have a single ovary with three separate styles and stigmas, that implies that the ovary was once three separate pistols. Um, so the ovary is fused together, but, they, but the stigmas and styles still remain separate. In the case of hibiscus, you have um, five petals, five stamens, many, um, sorry, five, pe five sepals, five petals, many stamens, one style, but the very tip of the style, oops, sorry, the very tip of the style are five different stigma. So one, two, three, four, five. And if you were to cut apart the ovary, you would probably find that um, there are, there's evidence of five separate pistols originally. But so the styles are fused, the ovaries are fused, the stigmas are still free and separate. And finally, in amaryllis, uh, one style, really long, but if you look at the stigma, it has three separate lobes. And if you were to dissect the inside of the ovary, you would see that based on the position of the ovules, um, that would indicate potentially um, uh, originally separate pistols. So we won't do any of this in the class, but uh, again, awareness is good. So if you were to cut open the ovaries of different species, you could find the ovules have different placements. So sometimes they're, all the ovules are placed along a, a single column at the center, um, and other times um, um, they are placed on the periphery of the ovary, sometimes on one side, sometimes a single ovule is hanging from the top, sometimes from the bottom. And these all have different names. Uh, but what is also interesting here um, is the presence of, of uh, these subdivided walls inside the ovary. Uh, so uh, these uh, these walls inside the ovary are called septa, or individually septum, and the open space uh, within uh, each of these walls is called the locule, which contains the ovules. So here's an example of something with axile placentations. Uh, placentation. This is a plant in the um, pineapple and um, uh, pineapple family. But if you cut open that ovary, you can see uh, one, two, three separate locules, um, and then which makes sense. This is a monocot, so it has flower parts in multiples of three, and then it has axile placentation because all of the ovules are mounted on this center column. Contrast that to um, this member of the poppy family, um, and it has parietal placentation. So you have the um, ovules are attached to the outside wall of the ovary. Uh, the other things to, uh, to, uh, um, that flowers can have are, are, are nectaries, and nectaries can occur in many different locations. Uh, sometimes they're near stamens, sometimes they're at the base of the whole perianth, or near the base of the ovary. In things like uh, 
um, Aqualegia um, um, columbine, there's, there's our so-called nectar spurs. These are extensions of the petal that forms into sort of this tube. And at the very bottom of this tube is where the nectar is produced. And so the idea is that that forces um, animals with long tongues or long beaks, in this case, hummingbirds, to get their head all up in here in order to get way down to the base of this spur to find the nectar. And in the process, they've probably done a good job of getting pollen all over them. And then in the case of uh, this member of the, um, oh, this is buckwheat. In buckwheat, if you zoom in uh, closely, you can see these uh, yellow swelling stru swollen structures. Those are um, forming a, a disc of nectar. So these are called nectar discs. It can get weirder though. There are even nectaries that are placed outside the flowers, so-called extra floral nectaries. And if you have uh, these uh, glands that produce nectar that are outside the flower, how does that aid in pollination? It doesn't really, but it still is a lure to other insects. So in this case, plants that have extra floral nectaries like in uh, uh, elderberry here, um, it's to attract ants, and the ants will defend their nectar farms, if you will. They don't want other insects getting that nectar. So the advantage is they have, um, um, away from the flower at least, a defense mechanism against potential herbivorous, um, um, herbivorous plants and pests. Now, flowers are grouped together in structures called inflorescences. And uh, a, uh, an inflorescences can be grouped in, uh, as either indeterminate or determinate, with indeterminate being far more common. And with indeterminate flower uh, inflorescences, um, the basal flowers on this group of flowers will mature first, so from the bottom up. And then on determinate flowers, uh, sorry, determinate inflorescences, the simplest type of uh, determinate inflorescence that's called a cyme. And in that case, what will happen is a single flower will come up. And then uh, on the side of that flower, there'll be two more flowers. And on this, on, on a compound uh, cyme, uh, there can be two more flowers that branch off of this side flower. And then that can happen repeatedly. Uh, but fundamentally, once there's a, a flower at the tip of a section, it stops producing flowers, essentially. But uh, uh, indeterminate inflorescences are far more common, and the, the default and simplest uh, inflorescence, uh, indeterminate inflorescence is called a raceme. And with a raceme, you just have a stalk of flowers, essentially, that are maturing from the bottom up. All the other inflorescences are some modification of that. So a spike, for example, is just a raceme that has um, a very short pedicels. So you imagine if these are very short, it would look like the flowers are attached directly to what's called the rachis here. And then uh, another derivation of a raceme is called a panicle. And a panicle is just a raceme that is branching. So in here, there's a, um, a flower that branches to have another flower that branches to have another flower, etc. So panicles are branching racemes. And then corums are where the pedicels are of different lengths, but they all grow to roughly the same height. So if you look at the whole inflorescence, uh, the flowers tend to be occurring at the same uh, level, um, but um, that is because uh, the pedicels are of different lengths. They're attached at different points. Contrast that to an umbel, uh, where all of the petals, sorry, all the uh, flowers are attached to a single point. So imagine what would happen if you compress the distance between flowers on a raceme. They would all end up at a single point, um, and um, um, you get what is it? an umbel. So some examples. Uh, here is a baptisia. It's a very good example of a raceme. So here's a single stalk, and on that single stalk there are Solitary, solitary flowers attached, and the ones at the bottom will develop and mature before the ones at the top. Another legume has another example of a different inflorescence type, the spike, 
And that is just a raceme that has flowers with very short pedicels. So on this uh, obedient plant here, um, you can see, if you look carefully, you can see that there's no evident pedicel. It looks like the flower is attached directly to that stalk. So that's how that's how we get a spike. And then uh, hopefully what we'll see on the 20th is examples of a panicle in the form of uh, Chinese privet. This is Ligestrum sinensi. So you can tell uh, in this photo that it's very clearly a panicle, which is just a branching raceme. So here's a central stalk that branches off into a secondary stalk that's branching off into tertiary stalks, and each time it's producing one or more flowers. Uh, umbels are characteristic of uh, the carrot family. So dill, parsley, Queen Anne's lace, carrots, zizia, all of them have umbels. Remember, umbels are where all the flowers are attached to a single point. And in the case, in this case, in the case of zizia, it's a, actually a compound uh, umbel. And so you have umbels of umbels. <laughs> so here is an umbel. All the flowers are attached to a point. And then all of these individual umbels are attached to a single point. So it's, it's twice compound. And then corms aren't as common, uh, but something like um, uh, Rowan, uh, Rowan uh, Sorbus americana is an example of a corum. And a corum, recall, is when uh, flowers occur, seem to appear at about the same height, but they're mounted lower um, on the, on the rachis. So uh, here you can see individual flowers are growing up to the same point, but uh, they have different length pedicels. And then uh, there are also uh, different kinds of cymes too. So there can be a compound cyme, like I mentioned before, where one flower comes up and branches into another flower, that branches into another flower, and every time it branches, the tip of that branch terminates. So there's no, there won't be additional flowers growing in this direction. But there can be asymmetry to that. And that's how we distinguish between a scorpioid cyme and a helicoid cyme. So in a scorpioid cyme, uh, basically the um, you get like this um, sort of curling pattern because the one of the side flowers aborts. And in the case of um, uh, uh, scorpioid cyme, cymes, the side flower that aborts alternates every time it branches. So, so here you can see, here's the first flower, and then uh, the flower grows on the right side, and then another one grows on the left side, and then it grows on the right side, et cetera. With a helicoid cyme, it's always on the same side. So in this example, terminal flower um, grows on the right, aborts on the left, grows on the right, aborts on the left, grows on the right, aborts on the left. So you get this more helical pattern. So, for example, uh, these both of these types of signs uh, are common in the family Boraginaceae, uh, the Borage family. And uh, it's hard to kind of see here, but what's happening is a scorpioid sign on this Phacelia, whereas on this species, oh, I didn't change the species name here, sorry. Um, uh, I'll correct that in the PDF. Uh, but another example in the Boraginaceae has a more clearly uh, helicoid sign, and you can see that coiling pattern happening here. And then there are a few other specialized inflorescences to be aware of. The most profound and maybe the most among the more common ones is, um, is a uh, the capitulum or head of the aster family, the asteraceae. So when you look at something like a heliopsis or an echinacea or a sunflower, you're not looking at a single flower. This is in fact an entire group of flowers. It's just that the individual flowers have become so specialized um, for, for in their position and their role that the, the whole inflorescence can look like a single flower. So if you were to, to take a heliopsis or a sunflower and cut it in half, you can more clearly see the actual individual flowers on a head of an aster. And in like in the case of Heliopsis here, you have two different kinds of flowers. This isn't always the case, but it's common. This is also the, this is also true on sunflower and echinacea, for example. And those are the ray flowers and the disc flowers. So the ray flowers, the flowers that occur on the outside perimeter, 
and the disc flowers are what are in the center of the inflorescence. And each individual flower is in rea reality um, a tubular uh, flower, a flower with a tubular uh, a corolla and an inferior ovary. In the case of ray flowers, though, what's happened is that one lobe of the tubular flower is much longer than the rest. So when those asymmetrical uh, tubular flowers are arranged in a circle, it gives the appearance that the inflorescence uh, is, is a single flower. And then uh, in the middle are the disc flowers, and those are more normal looking. They don't have, they're not quite as showy because they don't have these drama queen like uh, large petal lobes. Uh, but uh, more often than not, the disc flowers are those that, that can actually produce seeds. It is, it's not uncommon for the ray flowers to be sterile. They don't actually have functioning um, sexual parts. They're just there for the looks. So that's pretty wild. Now, there can be differences. So there are some uh, asters that just have disc flowers or just have ray flowers that can all be uh, reproductive. Uh, so, for example, um, uh, like a Joe Pye weed is still an aster, and that's still inflorescence. It's just a lot looser, and those are just a bunch of showy disc flowers in that case. And there are some other terms that uh, arise from this fusion of many flowers into a single uh, inflorescence, uh, or a single head. And uh, so one one of those is that there are at the base of at the base of this inflorescence there are many bracts so look like many little green sepals and in the aster family they're given the special term uh filleries because why not why not have it why not use the same term right and so that in that that collective name for all of the bracts is called an involucre so you could say it's an involucre of bracts or an involucre of filleries another family that has weird flowers is the Araceae, um and this is the like Anthurium family, or even, um, uh, uh, well, yeah, all the Anthuriums and, and aeroid plants are in this group. And they have an inflorescence called the spathe and spadix. So the uh, spathe, this is really large bract, and that's a very showy part. And then this, the uh, spadix is this column at the center, and that column contains separate male and female flowers that are very tiny. Typically, the male flowers are at the tip, uh, and then there is a bunch of female flowers at the base. So when these get pollinated, the fruit will tend to occur at the base of the spadices. So when um, pollination and fertilization occur, the flowers develop into fruit. And uh, the different parts of the flower will turn into different parts of the fruit correspondingly. So after fertilization, typically the sepals may wither away and fall off. Uh, the petals may wither away and fall off. And yes, gentlemen listening, even the stamens may wither away and fall off. Um, so what you're left with is a pistil. And then uh, from there, uh, typically the stigma and style uh, dry up, and then you are left with an ovary. And the ovary and everything in the ovary is what develops into the fruit. So the ovary will swell and become the fruit wall. The ovule uh, will become, will harden and become the seed. And the egg cell will fuse with a sperm cell, which is contained in pollen, and produce the embryo. So the result is in a given fruit, you have a, a baby plant surrounded by a hard outer protective layer. And then if it's a fleshy fruit, we'll have a fleshy outer layer that's derived from the ovary. Uh, there can be variation in that, though. So this is a cross-section of a peach. Um, and what's happening with a peach is it's a type of fruit called the droop, which we'll learn in a second, uh, where they're, one of the layers of the ovary actually hardens again and surrounds the hard seed. So in the case of a peach, uh, when you see the pit, or the same thing with plums and cherries, that's not the seed. The seed's contained in that hard outer layer. Um, and in and, and, and peaches especially, uh, next time you eat a peach later this summer, uh, break open the pit carefully, and you'll see the seeds inside. They look like uh, almonds. It's because peaches and almonds are very closely related. And if you've ever look up what an almond fruit looks like, it looks like a tiny dried peach. 
Um, anyway, so that that's a special layer of uh, of uh, tissue um, called a pith. Um, and uh, but it does illustrate that the fruit wall tends to have three different layers, um, and that uh, fruit layer is collectively called uh, uh, derived from the ovaries called the pericarp. Um, the outer layer is called the exocarp. The delicious part is called the mesocarp, middle. And then the endocarp is the layer of the ovary that hardens to be to um, surround the seed. So there's all sorts of kinds of fruit dispersal mechanisms too. And um, they have special names uh, or, or particular names. And the, the prefix, sorry, the suffix is okori. So if you see the word okori or okorus, that means the dispersal mechanism. And uh, exo zero chorus or exo zero cori would mean that it is dispersed on the outside of animals. So often exo zero chorus fruit will have some sort of uh, structures that will uh, that are evolved to attach to fur or to feathers or to clothes or detractors or whatever. The track to, and so they, they'll stick on something that passes by and eventually it falls off and gets moved to a new location. Endozoochorus are dispersed by animals internally, and that is what you see in the classic fleshy fruit. The idea is that some animal will eat the delicious ovary, the fruit wall, and then the, the hard seed will survive the digestive process and be defecated somewhere else. Some fruits, though, don't rely on animals to disperse. Uh, some of them will float on water, like in coconut or also um, birch and alder seeds do this too. They can float quite readily. Uh, and then others will disperse in the wind, um, like with say milkweeds or uh, dandelions. Those are fruit and seed structures. In the case of dandelions, that's an entire fruit. When you see one little puff ball unit, that's, a, that's actually a fruit and a, and a keen that has a, a parachute on it. In the case of milkweeds, the fruit itself opens up and releases seeds that have those uh, parachutes on them. Oh, and there's also things like uh, autocory, which is self-dispersal. That's fun. A local example is um, uh, la, 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 jewelweed. What's the Latin name? Bless. Uh, I will, I'll get in trouble from my professors. Um, anyway, jewelweed. <laughs> ah, um, I'll think in a second. But uh, jewelweed is a, a very common um, a native plant here, annual, very easy to pull up if you get it. It's kind of cool. Um, but their fruit, uh, they have a special kind of uh, capsule and the fruit wall develops, uh, or sorry, will mature unevenly. And as it matures unevenly, it will kind of create a tension. And so once it's ready to mature and, and something touches it, it will fling, uh, release that tension and fling the seeds away from the parent. Uh, so that's called autocory or self-dispersal. Then uh, fruits uh, can be classified in different ways too. We'll go over this briefly and I'll, just have to, I'll show you some references and then we'll be done, uh, mercifully perhaps for you, not for me. This is fun. I can do this all day. Uh, uh, so uh, we, we classify fruits based on the number of uh, flowers or how those flowers are fused to each other. So many fruits are, are simply simple fruits. So one fruit comes from one ovary of one flower. In other cases, a fruit can be derived from multiple ovaries from a single flower, like in blackberry. Um, or in other cases, there can be a multiple fruit where separate flowers fuse together um, um, at maturity. So the inflorescence becomes almost a single fruit. And a good, good example of that is a pineapple. Uh, all of these, uh, but, but all of these can can either be dry or fleshy at maturity. If they're fleshy at maturity, the implication is they're probably dispersed by animals internally. So they're putting all this energy into making something fleshy, juicy, and delicious for an animal to eat it and disperse the seeds. And then uh, you can also classify fruits by um, if they um, split open at maturity or not. So sometimes they'll split open and that will encourage the seeds to come out of the fruit. In other cases, they don't split open in maturity and the seed can germinate um, through the fruit wall or more commonly, uh, an animal will digest the, the outer part of the fruit. And there can be other features that we'll cover in a second. So this uh, 
um, the term for a simple fruit, so it's derived from a single ovary from a single flower, that is dry and does not open at maturity is called an akeen. Uh, so, and you can see here, here's the fruit wall, here's the seed inside of the cross section, and there's a, there's a gap in between the fruit wall and the, and the seed, which is important in a second. So a, a two well-known examples of akeens are uh, dandelion, uh, sunflower. Um, oh, well, this is a type of sunflower, not an edible sunflower, but but this is an example. Uh, this is also applied to um, um, a dandelion here, but there's an akeen and then there's an extension of the fruit wall um, that includes something called a pappus, and that's what aids in fruit dispersal. But if uh, more relatedly might be um, some edible sunflower seeds. So from Helianthus annuus, imagine um, a, uh, a you buy sunflower seeds in the sh in the shell. The shell is the fruit wall, and you crack open the shell, and inside is the actual seed. So the fruit of a sunflower is the shell in unshelled sunflower seeds. Now, if it's uh, similar to an akeen, except that the seed is fused to the fruit wall is called a caryopsis, or more commonly known as a grain. And those are the names of the fruits of grasses. And there are many grasses that we eat this, the fruit of, uh, many grains. So here's wheat, this is maize, rye. All of those are the fruits of grasses. And they look like seeds because the fruit wall is hard but it's been completely fused with the seed tissue beneath. So you cannot ever separate the fruit from the seed and grains. Nuts are sort of like an akeen, except that uh, a true nut anyway, is sort of like an akeen because the, um, the uh, uh, outer wall is just much, much thicker and harder. So a true nut would be things like uh, acorns, so there is a, a thick outer layer um, of the acorn. If you were to cut this open, there's a separate seed inside that. But this is technically the fruit of an oak tree. And then uh, members of the oak family are also known for having, uh, oh, sorry, members of the oak genus are known for having this extra structure called a cupule, which is like the cap of an acorn. But, but, the, but this whole thing is the true fruit of an oak tree. And here's lotus. And lotus is fun because um, it has, if you look at a lotus flower uh, or the, the, the uh, ovary of a lotus, there are um, separate ovaries that are fused, but ultimately they each produce a separate nut. So um, this, this uh, receptacle is where all the separate flowers are attached. Um, those that remains on the flower as it matures and then it then releases the individual nuts from the receptacle. Samaras are uh, winged fruit, dry and winged fruit. So classically, the uh, fruit of maples are called samaras. Really, that's not entirely true. They're actually a kind of uh, a schizocarp, but we'll cover that here. Um, but 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 uh, effectively think of them as uh, samaroid schizocarps or, or samaras. But what that means is that the fruit is shaped like a wing that's meant to be dispersed in the wind. <laughs> um, and then others that may that have akeens you may not know of include green like uh, sorry both green a all ashes have samaras. So here these are the fruit of ash trees. Even though they're in the olive family, they have dry fruit in this case. So you can see here's an individual fruit. And the seed will be inside the base of the fruit here. Uh, similarly, um, uh, tulip poplars have samaras, and the samaras are embedded in uh, right above these kind of hard, woody um, structures. Uh, so once the samaras leave this receptacle, um, these these woody structures get left over. You can st see them up in the canopy uh, sometimes. Follicles are simple fruits. They're dry at maturity, and they open on one side to release the seeds. So classically, milkweeds are great examples of follicles. 
a, a milkweed fruit will stay attached to the parent plant, but then the fruit will open up, it'll dehiss and release the seeds, which the seeds have individual extensions on them that aid in their dispersal. But also um, even the um, follicles, uh, even the fruit of columbine are considered follicles. They open up on um, uh, one side. They're derived from separate ovaries, but um, here's a aggregate follicle of, uh, of uh, columbine. Legumes are simple dry dehiscent fruits of the bean family, uh, Fabaceae, and they have they open up on two sides. So if you look at a say a pea plant, once they're mature, um, you'll see that um, each side of the pea plant will have um, sets of seeds in it. But this is technically the fruit of a pea plant, or the fruit of black locust, or the you've seen the. Uh, legumes of red buds. Those are all fruits. And similar to a legume, but in a different family, in the mustard family, Brassicaceae, they have silicles or siliques, depending on how they're shaped. So if they're long and narrow, they're called siliques. If they're short and squat, they're called silicles. But instead of having the seeds initially attached to the two uh, sides of the fruit, they're attached to another uh, piece of tissue at the center. So the um, the outer valves will fall off and you're left with this structure that contains the seeds. So look at mustard seeds, um, you know, anything in this family going to have one of these two types of fruit structures. And then the um, kind of most variable and maybe most common type of dry dehiscent fruit is called a capsule. And that's just a dry dehiscent fruit that opens up on multiple sides, not one, not two, but more than two. And um, they can they can open up in the, the lines of dehiscence. So the point they open up can vary. So sometimes they open up in between the septal walls. Other times they open up on the septal walls. Um, but that's not too important for, for this level here. But you can just see here's the fruit of this is of agave. Here's hibiscus. Here's uh, Dutchman's pipe. All those will split open at maturity to release the seeds. In this case, the fruit are staying attached to the parent plant. And other some other cool ones, uh, portulaca is cool because it the uh, fruit uh, pops off in a in a circle, and you're left with the seeds inside. And then poppies are really cool. They have what are called portisol capsules. So here's the whole fruit, but then these little valves will open up um, and um, it will stay on the parent plant and it will shake in the wind to like a pepper shaker fling the seeds from the from the fruit still attached to the plant. Then finally are the fleshy fruits and uh, there are several kinds. The default is the berry. Uh, and a berry just has, uh, is derived from a single ovary, um, has a fleshy um, mesocarp and endocarp uh, and the, the goal here is that the an, an animal will eat the berry, digest the fruit, and then defecate the hard seeds inside. So tomatoes are berries. Uh, grapes are technically berries. Um, Greenbrier, um, Greenbrier Smilax has berries. Blueberries are true berries. Blackberries are not. Strawberries are not. We'll see that in a second. Um, so tomatoes are fruit, indisputably. Don't listen to what the chefs tell you. They're wrong. Tomatoes are fruit. Thus spake the botanist. Uh, some variations of a berry, though, are droops. So droops, as I mentioned, with peach, they the inner layer of the fruit tissue, the ovary tissue, hardens and surrounds the seed and becomes the stone or the pit or the pyrene. Those are all synonymous. Uh, droops are pretty common, actually. So besides you know, peaches, cherries, plums, uh, avocados are droops. Technically, pecans and walnuts are droops too, because if you imagine a pecan, it has that fleshy outer layer that falls off, and then the shell is part is is the is the stone or the uh, pit, and then you open that up and you have the seed inside. A pipo, which is the very fun name, is uh, the specialized fruit of the cucurbit family. And this just means it's a berry that comes from an inferior ovary and has this extra leathery outer fruit wall. So cucumbers, squashes, pecan, uh, uh, pumpkins, um, melons are all pipos. 
Then there was also uh, 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 ex types of accessory fruits. So uh, those are fruits that the fleshy part is derived from something other than the ovary. In the case of poems, uh, which would include apples and pears, the, um, uh, the, the part we eat is derived from the uh, receptacle. So that's that part that where all the flower parts attach, it swells, it divides and swells and envelops the ovary uh, during development. So the, the core of an apple is, the, is actually what's left of the ovary wall. So when you're eating um, an apple or a pear, you're not eating ovary tissue like you would with most fruits. You're eating receptacle tissue, which is kind of cool. And then um, Hesperidia or Hesperidium singular is a specialized fruit of the citrus family, Rutaceae. And that just means it has a leathery uh, uh, outer ovary layer with lots of juice sacs in between. And those juice sacs contain delicious juice. Uh, I love citrus fruit. And then, uh, so those are all the simple fruits. And then there's also the complex fruits, uh, aggregate fruits and multiple fruits. So aggregate fruits are, uh, the fruit is singular, but when it was a flower, it was derived from uh, separate pistils that fused went after fertilization, uh, pollination and fertilization. So we've already seen uh, with magnolia, these are all se technically separate pistils, but after pollination and fertilization, those pistils fuse into a single unit. And then each unit opens up and releases a seed that has an extra fleshy layer called an arrow. But more familiar as an aggregate uh, fruit would be uh, blackberry. So here's a single blackberry flower. It has many stamens and many pistils. After pollination and fertilization, sepals fall off, petals fall off, stamens fall off, and then the petals, sorry, the, the pistils fuse and they produce individual droplets. So when you when uh, it's multiple droops, remember droops have a pit, right? A stone. So um, when you open up a blackberry, individual droop, you see the seed, but that seed has a fruit wall that contains a seed inside it. Then multiple fruits are derived from separate individual flowers um, that then fuse um, after pollination or fertilization. So. A pineapple here is an immature pineapple inflorescence. So it's kind of a, it's a few, it's a flower, sorry, it's a fruit derived from an inflorescence essentially. So here's the inflorescence of a pineapple. These are all separate flowers. After they are uh, pollinated and fertilized, they fuse in this one big juicy, delicious infructescence. Similarly, uh, this is the female inflorescence of sweet gum. And after pollination and fertilization, they fuse into the single fused ball and those individual um, units then open up to release the seeds. And then you step on them and break your ankle. Lots of fun. Same thing with sycamore. This is a this is a the female inflorescence of a sycamore, all separate flowers. No, oh, sorry, these these are um these are bisexual, I think. So these are all separate flowers. Uh, they get pollinated usually by the wind and they fuse together into a single infructescence, so multiple fruit. Uh, same thing with mulberry. They look sort of like blackberries, but they're actually derived from uh, separate flowers that fuse together after pollination and fertilization. So that was uh, it. That's it for our reproductive structures. So thank you for that. Thank you for putting up with it. And the final lecture will be hopefully about a half an hour long and be on tools and resources used for plan ID.